are welcoming a person who really brought focus on Ukrainian summer, summer kitchens. And uh, this is the kind of person who has a special gift to turn everything that she touches into a form of art. And uh, Ukrainian summer kitchens, it's not an exception. So today we welcome Ola Hercules, uh, who is a British Ukrainian chef and food writer. And Ukrainian summer kitchens is the focus of the third wonderful book, which is now about to come on the UK market. And uh, we've been thinking long and hard who we should be um, choosing and finding to uh, have a conversation with Ola. And we thought we would go for something slightly out of the box. So maybe it should be a person who has nothing to do with the culinary world, but who nevertheless less appreciates good food and appreciates all the good things that come out of Ukraine. And then, of course, we immediately thought of Peter Pomerantsev, uh, who is a well-known author as well, who also has got Ukrainian roots, um, but of course he is known to be um, a media expert and um, you know, a specialist in propaganda uh, and um, talking about special operations, um, you know, rogue states. We will not be mentioning any rogue states today. <laughs> today, Peter is taking a completely unusual um, new role upon himself. He will be talking about Ukrainian food. Uh, and much more behind it with Ola. I also would like to mention that Ola and Peter are really great friends of Ukrainian Institute London. Uh, Peter uh, was an anchor of a major fundraising event that we had in London a couple of years ago, and Ola contributed to our charity. And we are very grateful to them for their generosity. So now, without much ado, I would like to pass the floor to Peter and Ola. Thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us. It's, uh, it's a sweltering day in London, as, uh, as Marina mentioned. Um, and I've, uh, I'm, as this is a food event, I'm going to do it with a, a very nice glass of wine from the Provence, from southern France. Now, the wine is there, not really gratify me, but also as, as, as a kind of a metaphor, because um, it's a Mediterranean wine. And often when we think of Ukraine, we associate it with Eastern Europe, with Central Europe, with Poland, or with uh, um, some bits of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, or with Russia, of course, with Northern Europe. But that's not my sense of Ukraine at all. I think Ukraine is very much a, a Mediterranean country. Um, its uh, sociology is actually very Mediterranean. If you look at um, uh, kind of the values Ukrainians have, they're very similar to the values people in Sicily have. It's all about horizontal bonds and family and sometimes mafia and, and food and wine. It is also a wine culture, not a vodka culture, um, to a great extent. Um, and I think when I opened Olya's, Olya's book, her new book, and I'm a huge fan of her other books as well, I was struck by this Mediterranean theme of her book about Ukrainian food, because her focus is um, summer kitchens. Uh, which Marina began to talk about, a whole tradition of kind of al fresco dining, which you find all over Ukraine, which is a very, very Mediterranean phenomenon, often done in gardens full of vines and with homemade wine. Um, so without further ado, I think I'd like to start our, our conversation on this topic. Tell us more about the summer kitchens uh, and, and your experience with them. Sure. So um, I grew up with one and... Uh, so, you know, you get all sorts of uh, summer kitchens. You do get ones where you um, cook under an awning as well. But the ones that I had, our family had, and the ones that I researched, they're basically like miniature houses, basically. They're, they're miniature of your main house. And, um, you know, that have a roof and uh, four walls and a couple of windows and a, and a door. And inside, though, is just the kitchen. And I've done quite a lot of research, you know, the past six years I've been uh, researching this project uh, because I had one, but I didn't really know why we had it. So I started in my hometown. This one is uh, from Kosmach village in, uh, in, in the Carpathian mountains. Um, so it's this kind of thing. Mine was made out of brick. You know, it wasn't as glamorous looking as this one. Mine was a little bit more simple. But um, this is a place where people cook in the summer. 
uh, a lot of women that I interviewed uh, said, well, you know, in the summer it's super hot, there's no air cons, and when you do all of your almost semi-industrial kind of uh, preserving operations, it comes September, you know, when you have to preserve your blood, it's very easy to cook in the summer kitchen, open all the windows and the door and do it. And also they say, you know, your, um, the house stays really clean because um, all of the kind of your hub, your family hub just moves into the summer kitchen. The kids run around outside, then they just might come into the kitchen, eat something, get out, whatever. You just clean the kitchen, it's fine. It's much easier. But how they came about, uh, they existed in one form or another, I think, for, you know, since the beginning of the 20th century or even earlier. I'm not 100% sure because uh, records are a little bit shaky on that. But um, in the 1950s, for sure, after the Second World War and people kind of like settled into life a little bit more, uh, a young couple in Ukraine, uh, if they, they would get married and the first thing that they would build during the uh, warmer months, maybe starting in May or something, they'd quickly construct this mini house, essentially. This is one uh, near Rivne in uh, uh, Western Ukraine. Um, and they would put a makeshift bed there and a gas stove. And sometimes if there was a specialist in the village, they would come and put a masonry oven in. And then they would build their main house while they were li living in this tiny little place. Uh, they'll build the house. Uh, then they'll, uh, you know, I, I say, sometimes they say, oh, you know, they put their vegetable patch in, but it's not really a vegetable patch. As we've mentioned uh, just now, you know, they are massive garden. It's like a small holding essentially in rural areas of Ukraine, you know, like big, you know, a uh, big territory of kind of like just things that they planted. You know, they'd put their trees in the orchard, whatever. So all of this life would build around the summer kitchen. And then once it was all done and ready, they would move into the big house. And then the little house, which is just one room, would become this kitchen that they would use during the summer. And it had the function of cooking your normal daily meals during the day. And then of course, uh, in September, you know, filled with jars and uh, you, you, you know, all of your fermentation, preservation, jam making, preserving the glut for winter would uh, start happening. Um, and they differ a little bit in the kind of material that they're made of. We've, we've just seen a lot from, the West, from Western Ukraine where they're called shopa a lot. Uh, so a lot of wood. In the south where I'm from they use uh, brick, then they use the shells uh, near Vilkove in uh, southwest of Ukraine. They kind of just reflect uh, how houses are built locally. There's clay ones as well. And the whole point um, why I wanted to write this book was I really wanted to do a book on regional Ukrainian cooking because as you've mentioned, uh, Peter, I do believe that Ukraine's got a little bit of a Mediterranean vibe to it, but it's also, it's, it's quite diverse. You know, up north, you've got your forests and mushrooms and, uh, you know, slightly heavier, kind of like earthier flavors. And then, but then the most of Ukraine in the south and southwest, it is, you know, Elizabeth Luard, a great food writer, once said that Romania was like a Galapagos island in, in terms of culinary uh, influences and, uh, you know, one interviewing into another. But I think Ukraine is like that, too. And tell me, so you find these, these summer kitchens all, all over the country. And um, I think it's important for us to sort of, sort of to think a little bit about, like, you know, the meaning of, of food in Ukrainian culture. I was born in Kiev, but I grew up in London. But, but food played this sort of outsized role in our lives. Um, it was something that sort of my mother had her, her mother's and her grandmother's recipes passed down. People were incredibly proud of them. And, and it, was, it was almost it was a way of kind of preserving um, the national story and national identity. Um, oh, and I suppose for you as well, I mean, you're Ukrainian, you grew up abroad, but your relationship with Ukraine is somehow mediated by food. Yes, uh, yeah, 100%. Um, you know, when I came here to the UK, I didn't really cook, but I already had a handwritten, um, like a little notebook where my mom would, we, we sat down before I left and we wrote down all of these recipes, you know, loads of Ukrainian recipes and also some recipes that my Siberian grandma brought from Uzbekistan because she lived there for a while. Uh, so, you know, I had things like Beshparmak and, and, and stuff like that. And, um, and actually, one of the reasons why I started cooking and actually got obsessed with it, you know, you're making me think of new things, Peter. It's true. When I uh, 
when I realized how much I miss my family and home, that's I think when I started kind of like reaching for the pot and I started cooking. And of course I was a student, so, um, you know, and, and I wasn't very good at cooking, so it was rubbish. You know, I tried to make that fish once uh, <laughs> and it didn't quite work out. But uh, slowly, slowly, I started cooking more and more and more. And But you know, it wasn't even until I retrained to be a chef. It was a couple of years after that when I was already working that I sent a couple of recipes to the Guardian cook and they sent me a really warm, lovely reply. And they said, oh my God, Olya, your mom's recipes, we love them so much. And I just, and I just went, but of course, you know, uh, I, I feel like we've had a complex about our food for so long. Like, you know, people saying, oh, Ukrainian food is all about potatoes and cabbage and it's not worthy and whatever. And, you know, it was a big boom over to Langi food and Middle Eastern food and spices and everything. And I just thought, for ages, I didn't really see it that way. And once, once they kind of mentioned how amazing my mom's recipes were, it, it was just like a huge eureka moment for me. And then I went back to my mom and I said, oh mom, tell me about this dish, tell me about this dish, tell me about this, because you know, I've always enjoyed cooking their food and my, my family's food was incredible, but I never really uh, thought about it in terms of, you know, how they, actually strive to preserve some of that culture because you know soviet union was so aggressively uh you know standardization everybody's got to have the same dish and cook the same thing uh, and again from uh, elizabeth luard's interviews she interviewed someone in romania and apparently they said at some point you know somebody said yeah, that you have to give all of your recipe books and they burned them you know during the soviet years and it's it's that kind of um trying to erase this identity for so long, but people, I guess, didn't give up and, and look at me, I'm still kind of mega enthusiastic about it. And, and I'd, I'd be very interested, so, so although there's lots of people who've joined us today in this, in this, virtual, mm. in this virtual session, I, I'd love to know, what, we're gonna have a quick poll just to find out where everybody is. Mm. Um, so it'd be, I'd be fascinated to know where you are. I'm gonna go, for, I've, got, I've got it in front of me, I am, where am I? I am in London. You know what? I've been in London for four months. It's going, going a bit crazy. I dream of going as far as bloody Birmingham. Um, but uh, I think lockdown is going to be lifted quite soon in Britain. So we might be allowed to travel a bit further. Um, but yes, I mean, this is, this is, this is very true. And, and, and I, I, I assume we have listeners from across the world. And, and one thing that you can always connect with, with other people um who understand Ukrainian cooking across the world uh food is one of the ways you connect and, and really one of the ways you always connect is that they understand that that which is called borscht in russia is not borscht i mean i remember being in northern russia once and i have hunger school somewhere and they brought me some borscht and it was cabbage soup it was she it was like watery cabbage soup i was outraged because i'd grown up in a Ukrainian family in London, that borscht is full of, it's very, very dark red. It's very, um, uh, it's full of tomatoes sometimes, uh, yeah. a lot of beets. It's not watery. Cabbage is maybe an ingredient, but not a main one. Lots of heavy meat, um, very kind of like rich. And, and you know, it's almost like a marker of, of when I meet somebody abroad, if they understand that real borscht is Ukrainian borscht. And obviously you have, look, you have a wide range of exciting recipes in your, in your book, but you've got borscht there as well. Tell us a little bit about the borscht, the borscht that you have and, and, just, and just initiate us into the mysteries of borscht. Yeah, sure. Um, so borscht, yeah, cooked all over the world, all over the ex-Soviet Union. Uh, in Ukraine, it can be very regional. And you know, when I was growing up, I just had it in my head. You know, I can still hear my grandma saying, you know, borscht, oh, she had this borscht and it was really red. You know, it was crimson. This is wrong and criminal. And it what? was, you know, yeah, it's not. That's the best borscht. It, in my, my grandma, and listen with the reason why, in my grandmother's view, it had to be pink. The reason okay. why that is, is because in the, in the region of Ukraine where I come from, the beets that they used, were, you know, like the really fancy pink beetroots that you get now, Pyotr beetroots, that don't give off any color. This is the one that we, that we use in Ukraine because the, sand, um, the soil was quite sandy, so this is the beetroot that they grew. So all of the color, most of the color would come from the really pink, massive tomatoes that we have. And for ages, oh. they thought like, this is the correct borscht, and yes, <laughs> super thick. You know, as my grandma used to say, you know, that the 
uh, spoon has to stick out like it's a stew and uh, all of these things. Um, and, um, but it's very varied all over Ukraine. Uh, some components are, uh, some components are very similar, but it still varies. The ones in my, uh, in summer kitchens that I have, I've got one that's from southern Ukraine that I didn't include in, uh, in Mamushka. And this one is made with a cockerel, or, or you can use chicken and the whole, they use a whole chicken, you know, you don't joint it or anything, you just put the whole in, thing in, into a big pot, you make a stock, then you've got your beetroots, your zasmashka, which is your caramelized onions and carrots to give it that sweetness. That's another thing that, definitely um, is a Ukrainian thing rather than Russian. They, they, didn't, they don't really uh, use this technique in Russia. And uh, another thing that we do is we make this massive dumpling, essentially, with kefir and, um, and, and a little bit of baking soda, so it puffs up, but you poach it in the borscht, and then you take it out, and then you slice it. So it's like a piece of bread, but it's really fluffy and kind of poached in this borscht, and then you make this uh, garlic and dill paste and you put a little bit of wash in it and then you, um, you put, it, put that over, all over the, the dumpling and it's really delicious. And the other borscht is from Poltava where, you know when you mentioned recently that uh, you almost feel like that dark borscht that you've tried somewhere almost tasted French. Yeah, well, it's a very Provençal kind of flavor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kind of so yeah. listen to this, this one is even better. Even more, even more kind of like French in its essence. Uh, in Poltava, they make borscht um, either with, uh, well, the beef pork, but also duck sometimes. And they also make these dried pears, dried smoked pears, essentially. So you've got your peach, your masonry oven, like a wood-fired oven. And the way that they would do it, they would take whole pears and they'd put it on a, you know, tray or whatever they use. And, they, and at the end of the day, when the heat in the oven would subside and be really gentle, they'd put these whole pears in and leave them overnight. And they would repeat the process with the same pears for about five days or longer until they shriveled up and they look like almost leathery and black. And they've got this really beautiful, woody, smoky flavor. And they put these pears into the stock to flavor it. Mm. And it's just the most incredible thing. And uh, the recipe is in the book. And if you don't have these pears, obviously, even though I've adapted it for a home uh, kitchen and there is an adapted recipe for the pears as well, but you can also use um, Asian prunes. You know, your, your really beautiful French prunes work really well mm -hmm. in it as well. So yeah. So it's, um, so it's pears, beetroot, duck. I mean, that's just an incredibly beautiful combination, which I don't think you'd find in that fungus. Um, so, Look, I should just make it clear to everyone, the book's out very, very soon. It'll be sort of available okay. in, in all good bookstores, which are about to op have just opened again in, in London, I, and I hope they're opening across the world. I didn't understand actually why bookstores weren't uh, identified as essential, uh, essential shopping, but they weren't. They were closed over COVID, but they're mm -hmm. opening again. Um, so you can buy my book and Olya's. Um, but also, look, COVID has, has hit everybody hard and it's hit the charity and the NGO sector really hard. So look, if you can donate to the Ukrainian Institute in, in any way at all, um, you know, this is something that uh, we'd be incredibly grateful for, even if it's just five pounds via just giving. Um, uh, I think the information is going to be available online as we move through this. Um, look, you've, you've, you've made me very hungry, firstly, uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit annoyed because the only decent food near me that's open right now is a Korean, which just which is great, but just won't satisfy me after the, your duck beetroot pear soup. But why don't we have a look uh, at a short video where you do a little bit of cooking just to bring things alive for us, and people can take notes, and then we'll be back very quickly afterwards. I'll just quickly introduce it, as I don't think I did it in the video, I'm not sure. Uh, these are so, sort of like your call of tea, you know, your cabbage rolls, but in Western Ukraine, that little uh, summer kitchen that I said was in Western Ukraine. Um, it's uh, the woman uh, called Hanna showed me this recipe. It's basically beetroot leaves, which you know people are very um, quick to chuck. You get your beetroot, and if you've got your leaves, you're just like, yeah, that's rubbish, and they're not. Uh, you can use them or chard, and they're really delicious. And it's um, yeah, it's a vegetarian recipe. I filmed it on my own while my husband was like kind of walking around with the baby and stuff. So forgive the non-professional nature of it, but I really hope that you enjoy it. I've got some beetroot leaves, but they're quite small still. They're from my garden. So I've also got some chard leaves too. Um, it's pretty much interchangeable. You know, you can use either or. If you've got a nice bunch of beetroot with leaves on, don't throw them away. Just 
use them up in this um, or just wilt them with a little bit of, um, of butter and garlic delicious then I've chopped the stalks from both chard and the beetroot and for the filling I've got diced onion I've got half a large carrot that I grated on the rough side of the grater I've got 200 grams of mushrooms and a little bit of butter some garlic and I've got buckwheat here that I put on a flat tray and at 160 degrees toasted it in the oven for about 10 minutes until it became kind of a little bit brown and toasted but the buckwheat that we get here in, in Britain for some reason uh, overcooks very easily so just give it two minutes uh, boil it for about two minutes it will probably still turn into mush but don't let it discourage you it'll still all be delicious and then for the sauce I've just got a tin of chopped tomatoes but you can use fresh if you've got really nice fresh ones in the summer and I've got one onion sliced and two tablespoons of sour, uh, well it's not sour cream, it's actually French creme fraiche, uh, which I think is the closest to smetana, but if you have smetana, of course use that. And of course, we've got some uh, salt and pepper here as well. Okay, so today we're going to briefly steam our beetroot and uh, chard leaves. You can use them uh, fresh or raw like this as well, but I just want to make my life a little bit easier, so I'm just going to put them in here. You can just use a normal colander. And here I've got some salted water boiling as well. I'm just going to put my um, buckwheat in. So I've got my sunflower oil. It heats up. I'm going to put the chopped onion in for the filling, the diced onion. A little bit of salt too, because it helps the onion to release the juices and then it's, you know, there's less chances that it's going to burn and stick to your pan, especially if you're busy a parent or not, and you just forget about it. it. May have happened very recently. Okay. So yeah, these leaves are honestly not going to take that long. I just want them to kind of wilt down a little bit. The Hutu uh, woman that gave me this recipe said that actually in the past they just used to put the beetroot leaves out in the sun just to kind of let them wilt a little bit and then they're m much more pliable and easier to work with. We've got our onion in and this. Honestly, buckwheat, I don't know what it is, but this guy is going to overcook if you boil him for too long. We just want to take that raw edge off. Um, I'm just going to taste and see what's going on. I did it yesterday and it just completely disintegrated. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. Then don't forget about your onion. So the filling is, you know, inspired by things, but really is just what I kind of drummed up to, to do using some Ukrainian techniques like our smudging here right now. So we're just going to get these onions really super cool. You know what I mean? It ain't easy. Are they burnt? No, they're fine because we've put a little bit of salt in. Okay, take these guys off very quickly. These are nice and pliable now. I don't want them to become too wilted. Ooh, nice little bit of steam for you there. Okay, let's just move them here. Stop messing around. Buckwheat situation is getting there. Uh, I came up with this recipe in Ukraine actually, inspired by the Hutzel lady story and just used whatever we had in the house to be honest with you. So these onions are kind of getting there. You just want them to use a little bit of water if you see that there's just a bit, a bit of something golden at the bottom. Just to deglaze it a bit, just tiny, tiny bits of water, it helps to deglaze and also give these onions some help. We are going to add our carrots. I don't, if they're organic, I don't tend to peel them. Just scrub really well uh, if there's any soil or whatever, but really it's just, uh, yeah, uh, your carrot grated on a rough side of the grater. And, um, but you can julienne as well if you want to practice your knife skills. But I have no time, so I have to do this. Okay. And then I'm going to add my carrot as well. 
this doesn't need to caramelize too too much because it's like a really summery kind of dish so I want the sugars to come out but I don't want there to be too much of a cooked flavor I want it to be all kind of nice and fresh for these hobbitsies they are so so delicious Buckwheat. let's not forget about you all yes mm, good okay well it's much a much, much better situation than i had yesterday so we're just going to drain and cool it uh, if it's all kind of becoming a little bit too caramelized again just again this little trick with water is very good in uh, the recipe in the book ooh, that I put some steamed leaves on, here it is. Uh, in the book, the recipe says to dice the mushrooms. That's before I found out a really easy way to do it. When I had my uh, cookery classes, uh, my dumpling cookery classes in December, I just had this really beautiful vareniki filling with mushrooms and sauerkraut and chestnuts they're really good but you know there'll be kind of like 12 people coming here at a time and you'd want to give them a good portion of vareniki of course so i had to process so many mushrooms and dicing them was just i was heavily pregnant as well so i thought what are you doing i mean it's it all kind of cooks down into nothing anyway so you know your mushroom rough side of the grater Boom, keep going. And you know, it takes very, very, very quick. If you've got little bits like that hanging around, don't worry about them. It will all cook down into nothing anyway. Make sure you don't burn your carrots. Just give them another little, uh -huh. just add a little bit more. So I do apologize if there's inconsistencies in this video in terms of my top-down situation that I try to do so professionally but I, uh, I, I couldn't do everything at once, it's, it's quite tough uh, with little bit Let me just check that this is running, hold on. I just had a moment of complete and utter panic. I thought, did I even press the play button? All of this material I'm giving you here. Okay, just joking. It's all good. It's all good. For the mushrooms, you can fry them together with this situation, but they will get a lot more colour if you do them separately. So, I'm just going to take the mushroom over. I'm just going to take the onion and the carrot and put them into a separate bowl. Actually, super, super easy to do on a grater for any filling. I highly recommend it. Let's call it a mushroom hack. Okay. So that's there. So you could do it either mushrooms first and then this, or this first and then mushrooms. Whatever takes your fancy. Put a bit of oil in and heat up. Mushrooms like to be just have a bit of spirit in that uh, heat, as my grandmother used to say. Shop. Again, season it. Here you go. The mushrooms are good in the summer, and of course, this would make for a really good filling in winter as well. I do highly recommend adding chestnuts to mushroom fillings like that. I don't know, it just does a really beautiful thing. I heard that uh, chestnuts are actually used somewhere northeastern Ukraine, I think. But we didn't make it there during our uh, journey, unfortunately. You know what? If, if I could, I would have, if I didn't have child, well, child at the time, if I didn't have a child, we had to go to school i would have moved to ukraine for at least six months and then well it would have been a completely different journey and completely different book maybe even uh, but that, that was that's something that i would have done but i couldn't i'm a mom so we had to take kind of really intense trips 
and had to pack a lot in during those trips as well. But super lucky to have met loads of people, just your, you know, somebody's grandma, somebody's auntie, uh, and also a few uh, Ukrainian food writers like Mariana Dusharin in um, Lviv. We had a feast there. Garlic scapes. Uh, what else did we have? Oh, delicious mushrooms that we picked up at the Lviv market. Uh, she made this incredible salad with tomatoes and mulberries and uh, purple basil. All of that is in the book and I, I highly recommend trying trying those dishes. Oh, mushrooms are getting there. What I'm looking for is for them to not to be too wet, but a little bit of moistness is quite good. Um, and to just get little bits of color here and there because mushrooms, as we know, you know, when they've got that lovely caramelized flavor to them, that's when all the flavor comes out. Okay. My good old water trick. Just got that. That in. And have a little gold here. Okay. Okay, now the water has evaporated. And what I want to do in the book, I add these to the sauce. Uh, so these are the beetroot and chard stocks. But today I fancy putting them into the filling. So what I'm going to do is add a little bit of this unsalted, but you can use salted, whatever, uh, really gorgeous butter. Paranoia speaks again. I'm just going to check that I'm filming this. Okay, um, butter is in, and now I'm going to put our beetroot stalks. All I want here is for these to uh, lose the hardness and the crunch, and just to soften down a little bit, because we're not actually going to cook the whole tea in the sauce for too long. I want, I want them to retain that summery uh, feel. As you've noticed, I, I kind of um, season as I go along each step of the way because then once I taste it at the end, it's kind of there. I don't know, just, you, can, you can just season the filling in the end, but I, I feel like this is just the way I do it. I season as I go. So here we go. Now we're going to add our chopped garlic because everything is better with garlic. Okay. Oh, the smell. It's so good. Butter, garlic, and a little bit of that um, beetrootiness. It's outstandingly delicious smelling. Uh, then I'm just going to, again, add a tiny bit of water. Typical. did not burn because I added a little bit of water to it. Mm -hmm -hmm. Cool. Look, it doesn't matter. There's some bits there. It's all good. I've got this. So now, the sliced onions. And you can do them into kind of half circles. I, at Otolenghi, for some reason, we always went, maybe it's a Middle Eastern way, we just went lengthways, so into kind of bits like this, and this is how I do it now. So we just put it in, giving it a little salt draws the juices out and it kind of makes for the perfect uh, perfect conditions where they're frying but they're also kind of a little bit steaming and self deglazing etc. So Huh, guess what I'm gonna do now. 
Yep. Gonna add a little bit of water. Spa. Sorry, my, ju my drugs are pretty lame today. I had a pretty sleepless night. Okay. Do, 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 do. too much I just want them to really soften and mellow um, yes and then what we're going to do after is just add this tomato you can get really good tin tomatoes in the UK otherwise just great a big juicy fresh tomato about 500 grams um, if you cut it in half and then grate it like this you're gonna be left with the skin in your hand uh, or you could just put the skin in who cares Oh, delicious. Yep. They're softening nicely. My beetroot and chard stalks, uh, fried mushrooms, and fried onion and carrot. Or add the really actually decent looking buckwheat. Not like the, the one I did yesterday. Jeez, it's like so mushy. That's not my buckwheat. It's too mushy. Pretty good. Nice and soft. The tomatoes in. And these thin tomatoes are lovely, but using a little bit of grated fresh tomato, if you can get hold of really flavoursome ones, you know, it just makes it all even fresher. That's it. And then obviously we need to season this too so just a bit of salt and it's just going to simmer for a bit with the, with the lid kind of up on and I'm going to show you how to roll the poppy seed are you ready? Right. and I think when is she going to put that front fresh in? I'm going to put it in right now Yes, correct, Wilfred. So. Are you using this audio? I am using this audio, yes. It's all like live and oh, fun real. and real. Real, man. So real. Okay. So. You just stir it through and it becomes beautifully pink. <laughs> yes. Okay. So then, oh, let's get rid of this. Then, here's our beetroot leaf and a crying baby. Uh, our lovely filling. Look how beautiful that is. Why would you throw that in the bin? Oh, thanks guys for making noise with the tea and things. Okay, put this in. Then we're just going to do, flip it up to the sides. And then just... Roll it into this kind of thing. Okay, shall we go again? Here is a chard leaf, which is equally beautiful. with a bit of sauce as well. Okay, they are ready. There's um, some sourdough bread. I've got a recipe in the book as well. Some really pretty ones. So this one, and this one, and this guy here. 
I mean, three is not enough, is it? And this one. And of course, a little bit of the sauce on top. And I think more sour cream, always. More. Okay, done now, guys. There you go. I hope you enjoyed this slightly chaotic demo. <laughs> and here we are. Um, beetroot, leaf and chard holopsy stuffed with mushrooms and buckwheat in a light summery tomato sauce with some bread and loads of crumb fresh. Oh, yeah, sorry about this slightly, uh, yeah, the editing uh, was a bit dodgy. Sorry about that. <laughs> it was very, it was cool. I think it was very good. I thought the colors really came through. And then something else that really came through apart from the obvious deliciousness was that, you know, this is a, a kind of slow and patient cooking. Um, some of the recipes in your book, they take months to make. Tell yeah. us a bit about, about fermentation. <laughs> So the arduous bit is actually super quick. So you don't, unless you are fermenting 40 kilos of aubergines, but you don't have to do that, obviously. Um, so yeah, fer fermentation or, you know, when I, when I go back home, I sometimes say the word in Ukrainian and I say fermentatia and then my mom and my auntie and everyone just, you know, laugh at me. They, ju they just think it's a super cold kind of like scientific word, which we don't use. We say kvashenya, which means to, um, make things go sour and it's a huge tradition in ukraine you know we, we had no idea that it was good for you we had uh, we had no idea about the science really people just knew how to do it and it's really easy it is i know that the, you mentioned before that it kind of like petrifies you but all you're doing is you you know get a couple of really good let's let's just take something super simple like cucumbers yeah take really nice cucumbers at the end of the season they're the best because um uh, they will be a little bit drier almost and you and you want that you don't want a super watery cucumber and you put them into a jar you don't have to go crazy with sterilizing the jars by the way because uh, especially don't use super harsh chemical uh, or you know like uh, really chemical detergents just a nice eco detergent on your jar and maybe some hot water poured over it is all you need because you want some of the yeasts and things to survive and to make the process uh, kickstart. So you put your vegetables in a jar, then you just pour some salted water over and maybe you add some flavorings, maybe some garlic. Uh, we love in Ukraine, we love all allspice and uh, dill, you know, dill umbrellas. Uh, but you can just put them, instead of chucking away your dill stocks when you buy a bunch of dill, keep them and then use them in your uh, fermented veggies. And then you just leave it in this heat for three days and you will see, I mean, you'll see bubbles probably in a day in this heat. But in about three days, some things will start even tasting sour. Um, and then it will be maybe if you're doing something like, I have a really great recipe in summer kitchens for these uh, cabbage leaves called pelustka, which means um, kind of like rose petals. Instead, uh, so a whole white cabbage, instead of doing a kraut with it, you cut it in half and then you cut it into kind of like chunks like this, still attached by the, um, by the core. And then you put it in a jar with some beetroot uh, and uh, again, maybe a few flavorings here and there, and then you pour the brine over. Uh, my rule is about 20 grams of salt to a liter of water, and that's it. And you just leave it, and within a week in this weather, you will get like a really nice, sour, crunchy, delicious pickle. But of course, there's more to it. You also cook with them as well in Ukraine. It's not just a pickle. Yeah, and you're quite right then. There's now a health craze around them. I guess kombucha is part of this as well, no? That's part of that whole kind of story. I was just um, yeah. And we, actually, we used to drink kombucha in the 80s. Yeah. Did you? No, I remember, I remember. Yeah, no, I yeah. remember my, 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 you'd I'd come into my granny's and she'd have these, <laughs> what looked like weird laboratory experiments, these jars <laughs> of kind of like strange mushrooms fermenting, which looked petrifying. And now I'm paying £4.50 at Waitrose for kombucha, <laughs> which my granny used to make. Um, <laughs> There's actually a very good story about one of your grandmothers in, in, in the book um, who, who made these rather lovely little blini stuffed with 
um, quite a complex stuffing, mushrooms and, and chicken. And you write very movingly how, you know, there seemed to be something almost therapeutic in the slow way of cooking this, folding it, making it. It actually reminds me a lot of the Passover meal, which is also a meal to do with therapy, which is very, very slow, very arduous, which is all about really dealing with memory and, and grief and, and trauma of some sort. And, and I also wonder whether, uh, I mean, you need to write about your grandmother and you kind of allude that she had a very complicated life, she was sent to Siberia, but, but I also wonder to what extent food plays this kind of therapeutic role and this role of kind of coming to terms with, with, with trauma in Ukrainian history without even getting into the obvious history of the famine. Um, you know, Ukraine is both the breadbasket and then it's constantly invaded because it's the breadbasket. Food goes so deep into kind of the ideology of the country, but also it's a way of, of, of kind of dealing with the past. And, and t tell me a little about that, because I think that runs through your book as well. Uh, yeah, um, so very quickly, one, yeah, one, one grandma is actually from Siberia and it wasn't a, uh, you know, it was uh, super traumatic events happening there as well. Uh, and then the other grandma was in um, in Ukraine, but uh, they were kind of well-to-do farmers. Uh, so of course they were, you know, Raskulachny, um, and she she was sent. I, she was a child, and she was sent with her siblings and her mom to Siberia in a train, cattle train, and they were just dropped somewhere in the middle of, of a forest in winter. And eventually they, uh, they found Russian families and they worked for them. And uh, my granddad, my great granddad, sorry, stayed in Ukraine at the time. Uh, and that's when Holodomor happened. And he was dying in the street and he, the family doctor, uh, they always mentioned, I don't know why, uh, that he was a Jewish doctor. We actually, we, we also uh, think that we might have um, uh, some Jewish uh, roots in our family, but because because my another great great grandfather was Moises, but I don't know. There's something there as well. But um, he saved him. He took my great granddad into a hospital and put him in the section where they had, had typhoid uh, patients, knowing that uh, the Soviets wouldn't come and check. Uh, and he nursed him to life. He fed him, and he, my great granddad didn't get typhoid. And in the end, the family reunited. So you know, there's. A lot of trauma, a lot of trauma, and my uh, my grandmother's, uh, uh, you know, husband, my grandpa, my grandfather Victor also went through war, etc., etc. You know, super, super trauma, escaped to a concentration camp, all of these things. And then, you know, there we were when I was a kid. There would be uh, just outside the summer kitchen, which still exists. My uncle lives there now. My grandma is, is long gone. Uh, there was a table, they would put a table outside under a walnut tree. And I remember, you know, my grandma had six children. My mom was the youngest. So the extended family was huge. You know, loads of children my age, slightly oldest uh, cousins, etc. And, you know, everybody would get together quite often. And I think that's where my love for storytelling comes. And we, they would sit there and they would tell stories. Obviously, we'll eat and drink and all of this is connected. But they tell, sometimes they'd be super funny stories and they'd laugh their heads off. And sometimes they'd start singing and sometimes they'd start crying. Like quite, it, it was quite intense, especially for us kids. We'd, we'd just be messing around and then suddenly people start crying. You know, our family starts crying. And sometimes we joined in too, you know. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently and I just thought, how did they manage to, after all of these atrocities and all of the stuff that they've been through, how did they manage to remain such lovely people because you know my grandma may have looked a little bit austere sometimes and you know she was strong she was kind of like a proper matriarch because my my granddad came back out from the war like properly traumatized he was really subdued and you know funny but he kind of like stayed in the shadows a bit and she was the one who was like six children you know the animals and cooking and everything but I, I thought about it a lot and, you know, all of this talking that they did and the crying and the laughing. I mean, that's therapy, isn't it? It's, a, some, it's, a, it's, it's family therapy. Uh, and, and also they've, um, they've passed this on to us, you know. They've, um, they, I know a lot, a lot of these stories, uh, they, they stuck with me. And, you know, maybe I didn't appreciate them as much as I, when I was a kid. But now I keep thinking back and I keep asking my mom questions and, and, and just trying to 
put the story together actually because um but yeah definitely there's 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 a therapeutic quality to cooking to cooking with intention as you mentioned you know my grandma out of my siberian grandma used to make she'd make a normal blintz like a, a pancake but then she'd cut it into four little uh triangles and then she'd make really tiny ones filled with chicken and you know all of this energy and good kind of like thought and attention and observation that you put into cooking that you know that's what's cooking with love is really isn't it it's just paying attention and um so yeah there's therapy everywhere there with the cooking and with the eating and also with the storytelling which was so uh prominent in our family for sure and i think i'm sure in loads of other ukrainian families i think your, your photographs actually bring this out as well um so a couple of questions from from people who are tuning in sure. um one from lydia Dool, uh and lydia asks um, she once had to explain to her husband, her English husband, what Ukrainian cooking was like. And uh, she ended up saying, well, look, it's a mixture of Italian and Turkish. <laughs> she wanted to explain it in terms familiar to him so he could yeah. understand. So if you're introducing what is Ukrainian cooking like to somebody who has no idea, how do you do it? Um, well... You know what, that description is actually not far off in terms of if you had to go by countries, definitely, like so much polenta and mushrooms up in the north of Ukraine and then down south, you go and you get these massive tomatoes, aubergines, and some techniques are a little bit Turkish and some techniques are a little bit Italian, you know, if you think about the Romania that's next door, you know, there's all, the, and Greece as well, you mentioned that before as well, uh, by the Sea of Azov, there was a really old kind of Greek settlement there and uh, loads of, um, uh, there's a bread that uh, my family makes called Platsin, uh, no, sorry, it's not Platsin, it's Plakopsin. I don't know where the word comes from, but they are, we call them Greek breads because they come from this settlement where the Greeks were. Uh, it's filled with, uh, you know, brinza, but I would imagine it would have been feta at some point in time. Um, so yeah, in terms of uh, uh, which countries, it resembles definitely that, even though, of course, there's this uh, tradition of fermentation with vegetables and even whole watermelons, etc. But my, uh, the, the way that Ukrainian food is the same, despite all of the regional, uh, you know, idiosyncrasies and uh, historical uh, kind of echoes, it's very ingredient led, you know, you know, and that's why I was so keen to write about these summer kitchens, because really good Ukrainian food uh, comes from a very good ingredient. You might have five ingredients and it looks so simple, but when you taste it, it's just, it's just amazing. And it's not, it, but you can't just cook, you know, it's not only in Ukraine that you can cook that way. You can cook that way in Britain. You just have to get nice local ingredients and maybe adapt somewhere, but you know, it's simple cooking and in some uh, some parts of it are very simple and there obviously there's all, all, all the breads and technical things as well but um but it's always for, for me it's it relies a lot on ingredients because apart from a little bit of allspice here uh, with, with your pickling or caraway and coriander here and there or maybe of course you've got paprika in uh, western ukraine but otherwise there's not much spicing that you you can hide behind You've got to, and you, you've got to put your effort into growing something, and then you, you know, you make your borscht, and it's just it blows your mind. Yeah, I remember my mother's agonies uh, <laughs> trying to find tomatoes in England, which and cucumbers. I mean, it's changed now. Now you can, you know, it, yeah, and, it has. You can you can pay ridiculous amounts of money and get and get good tomatoes, but just her agony and just all my childhood, her just going these aren't tomatoes these aren't tomatoes these aren't real tomatoes and these aren't real cucumbers this is not food um and it is true i mean in, in ukraine the stuff is just bursting with flavor um another question it's actually about the border regions it's from saskia heller and she's asking about um have you tried cooking recipes from the border regions and for example from vinokradov where all the recipes you know from transcarpathia i think where all the recipes are obviously hungarian and yep. is that something you encountered as well? Because actually, some of the best food, some of the best Hungarian food I've ever had was in Uzgorod, uh, in Transcarpathia, with a large Hungarian community. And it was absolutely delicious. But it was, you know, very, very classic Hungarian food. Yeah. Uh, so we went to this uh, village called Nizhnya Selisha uh, in Transcarpathia. Um, so, you know, you had your your borders kind of 30 kilometers away. You had Hungary and you had Romania and you had Slovakia. 
and um, the language was different and uh, you know there's a, di a very strong dialect there that I, I had trouble with um, but then the cooking as you say there were some incredible Hungarian dishes like bograc for example uh, it's it's kind of like a broth a thick broth that you cook over fire and it, the way that they cooked it there had probably like four types of meat in they had a big like piece of beef they had a pork ribs and they had some smoked pork and and you had had some, uh, you know, lard as well, like really good quality lard. So, you know, very rich. And also it was all like tinged with this fantastic local paprika. And, um, and they put like whole vegetables in. So you had like one whole onion and that was the prized kind of vegetable that you get. And if you know, if you know it, you just be like, I have the onion please, because it'd be saturated with all of that meat and paprika flavor. Um, but of course, they also had, um, you know, your cabbage rolls, so the, except that they were really little, something that my grandma used to say that she made as well, though, in the South, so I don't know. And then you would get your borscht and you get your vareniki, but then you'd get other dishes, which uh, actually, in my research, I really found hard locating. There was one called um, kolduni, and maybe somebody knows this uh, recipe. In my research, I found out that they make something like that in Belarus, but it's a different, it's the same name, but it's a different kind of thing. In Transcarpathia, it's, um, it's this kefir dough that they roll out and then they fill with, uh, with a mushroom, a kind of like, oh, amazing forest mushrooms, roll it up, cut it, and then they fry these kind of rolled dumplings and then they poach them in a white kind of like sour cream sauce. Delicious. I know it sounds maybe a little bit heavy, but just like oh, you can't stop eating it. So good. But kolduni and where, where it comes from, in my research, maybe the word comes from Tata, uh, some kind of a Turkic influence there. I don't know, um, but it also appears in Belarus, but it's a completely different dish and maybe even in Lithuania. But yeah, it's really interesting how even, you know, they have Hungarian dishes, but then they've also got some that God knows where it came from. And that's, you know, it's, that's, a, that's been a fun part, trying to kind of put the puzzle together almost. I think there was a question about Salah. I just saw it flash across my screen. Do you do, do, you do Salah in your book? I mean, I've looked at your book. I didn't, I didn't spot it. Do you have? No, uh, basically I, wasn't, I couldn't repeat recipes from my first cookbook, Mamushka, but in the ingredient list, I did mention Salah and I sneaked in a quick recipe in there. So it's not a real recipe, but the recipe is in there. But basically what, what you do is you, is you get a, um, a a belly, I guess, I don't know where, where you'd be, maybe you will have a cut where it's mostly fat, just with a little bit of meat. Uh, and you just pack it, you just cover it with salt and you leave it in the fridge for maybe three days and then it just salts through and then, you, uh, you know, it, it, it cures it. And then you just, um, you just put it, I, I keep it in the freezer, my mom always brings some. So I, I've always got like a massive piece of salo in my, in my fridge. And you know, it's been cooked so much in London recently because it's lardo essentially, it's Italian lardo, which has become such a trendy kind of thing. And I'm just like, <laughs> well, we've got our salo, you know. So, yeah. yeah, no, it is, it, is, it is a shock going to kind of health stores and supermarkets now and seeing all my granny's food, kefir, uh, kombucha, is now is now meant to be the health crisis. It's amazing. But you can get yeah, you can get Ryashanka as well. Um, but listen, you have so many wonderful wonderful uh, recipes in the book. I was thinking, are there any more any are there any more questions that I I, I feel that you know I want to include our audience as much as possible? Uh, hold on, let me see. Ah, oh, I found the little thing in the question. Okay. Um, okay. What? Okay. Did you um? Is knish something that you've uh, that you've explored? That's a question from Anna, Anna Rose. No. Uh, no. I it's... wonder whether it's it's it said it's a potato bready dish. Is it some sort of kulish or something on a village saint's day? I don't know. Knish, I know. You do the... have you, you you do have some amazing kind of uh, celebratory pastry and bread dishes, don't you? Yes, I do. Um, about, sorry, about Knish, no, it's an oversight, but I'm making notes. Uh, in fact, Sasha, remember Knish, my son is just behind me. Can you, can you write it down? Can the five-month-old one? No, the eight-year-old. I've got an older okay, son as yeah. well. But yeah, well, thank you so much, because I, I know the name, but I haven't uh, encountered them on my travels. But I do have celebratory breads. I've got a massive um, koravai. Well, actually, I've made it for the 
you know, a home cook kind of initiation thing. I've made it much smaller. The, I went to apparently one of the biggest uh, kind of um, le legendary Korovai maker in Poltava, this incredible woman. Uh, she works with kind of like 11 to 14 kilo doughs. So she makes Korovais. There's a picture of, of it in the book, which is mm -hmm. just there, and it's this big. She's so, and she uses a, I don't know how, but she uses her also like her masonry oven, the peach. So that's how she bakes it. It's massive and beautiful and really tasty because she gave us some to taste. She's so famous that apparently someone came from New York. They flew into Kiev, uh, ordered the Korovai from her, you know, found out about this woman. She sent it on the train or something with someone to Kiev. They delivered the Korovai and I don't know how, but they took it back to New York for somebody's wedding. So Korovai is a Ukrainian wedding bread. Uh, and uh, yeah, met her and she gave me the recipe or, you know, gave me the recipe. I don't know. She gave me, she gave me an idea of a recipe and then I kind of tried to figure it out because of course it must be a secret. She's, uh, she's a real legend. Are there any more questions? Well, hold on, let me think. Uh, there's lots of comments, people sort of talking about experiences. Um, okay, good. All right. Well, listen. I think I think we're almost coming toward. We're slowly rounding towards the end of our. Of Gina, was there anything that you would like to add? So were you talking to me? Have you disappeared for a sec? Oh no! I, I was asking whether Marina yeah. Marina had anything to add to before we round up. Patience. You're so, muted. Uh, yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Yes, I, I truly enjoyed the conversation and I just would like to say that lockdown gives us an excellent opportunity to try new things and I really finally got down to cooking some recipes from the Mamushka book so I'm pretty sure the rest of my summer will be you know spent on trying things uh, from the new book by Ulla and I'm really looking forward to laying my hands on it. Okay. Uh, thank, you much, thank you very much for the conversation. Oh, yeah, I'm afraid I'm not letting you go quite yet because I've got a couple more questions, which you're going to have. They're very specific ones uh, sure. to do with your uh, Holopsi video. So, <laughs> Claire McCabe says, I'm not a fan of mushrooms. What can be used as a substitute? I had the same question, actually. Could I be using meat in there? Does it have to be mushrooms? Oh, yeah, no, it doesn't. I, sorry. So, the reason why there's mushroom is that in there is because my husband is vegetarian. So, I always try to adapt Ukrainian recipes and uh, do like a vegetarian one. But yes, of course, like a uh, typical meat one would be uh, either uh, ground pork or even, my grandmother apparently never actually used to use a grinder. She used to cut it by hand. That's again, your kind of like attention and cooking with mm -hmm. attention. She, she cut it into very small pieces by hand and that would be so delicious because that, that those little pieces of pork will steam inside and you can either use barley or rice um, and you can uh, still use the chopped uh, stalks and the carrots and the onion etc uh, but then if you didn't if you wanted a vegetarian one which was a mushroom again you can just up the amount of your onion and carrot and just up the amount of grain so you can just do like uh, really heavily like barley uh, which would also be delicious and do you have a question from Alison Goodings? Uh, what leaves can be used instead of beetroot? She's got spring greens, purple sweetheart, savoy, and cavallo nero in her garden. Huh. So all could you those. use those? Absolutely, yeah? all of those, and also uh, chard. Chard and, and beetroot is almost interchangeable, so that's kind of the, the best substitute. But everything that you've just listed, including mm -hmm. kale, I, if you steam them uh, first, they'll become pliable, and you can do that. I'm actually quite intrigued. I might try the kale ones. Yeah, yeah. That, no, no, it's, 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 it's very nice. The, um, also, I noticed in your book you have some sorrel recipes, which I think is a, a sadly underused plant here. But I've now seen it appear at farmer's markets. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I see it more and more in, in, in England, at least. Yeah. Um, okay, good. I think that's all for the moment. But I, I'm glad we, we caught those as well. Uh, Good. Is there any? Is there anything more that we, we need to add, Marina? Have I, I always forget to do something like official? I said support the Ukrainian Institute. Hopefully, somebody more people will be supporting it. Uh, we've mentioned that Olya's book is coming out on the twenty fifth of June. 
Ah, question, is it going to be translated into Ukrainian? Um, so the way that it works is that a Ukrainian publisher has to approach the English publisher and ask them to buy the rights and then they translate it. So far we haven't had any interest, but I don't know if uh, the economic situation is a bit tough at the moment. So I don't know how many foreign uh, sales uh, there are going to be. Uh, Poland has signed up, they're going to have uh, summer kitchens in Polish. It's coming out in, in the US, Canada and Australia. Um, Mamushka was actually, trans, you know, bought and translated into seven or eight languages, I believe. But I'm hoping maybe Italy will pick it up. They picked up a Mamushka, so fingers crossed. But yeah, it would be so lovely for it to be in Ukraine. Fingers crossed. I don't know how, you know, if it's possible, but I really hope that it, it will be there and people will be able to see it and just be like, ah, oh, our culture is amazing. Summer kitchens are amazing. They're not regular, unremarkable things. They're actually very special.